Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in the third week of this course, we are going to deal with metaphysical poetry. This is a phenomenon in the 17th century. So, we will look into the historical context and the literary context that made this metaphysical poetry possible. We will examine some of the practitioners of metaphysical poetry, John Donne, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan and Andrew Marvell. We will also examine the evolution of the concept of metaphysical poetry from William Drummond, John Dryden, Dr. Samuel Johnson, H. J. C. Grayerson, T. S. Eliot, George Williamson. We will see the several features that make up this concept called metaphysical poetry. We will discuss the definition of W. Bradwood Smith about this metaphysical poetry. We will also see two best examples, one from Smith, another from Brooks as part of this lecture today. As you can see, many historical events joined together to make up this era, early 17th century. First, we notice the East India Company was formed in 1600. Then we see King James the first becoming the king ruling England from 1603 to 1625. At this time, we find a very interesting phenomenon of religious conference that is called Hampton Court Conference, where different factions belonging to various religious groups try to arrive at a common consensus. They could not succeed, that is a different story and that led to the gunpowder plot meant to kill the king and other courtiers, but they did not succeed. It was at this time we find William Harvey discovering the circulation of blood. What is there inside our own body, we were able to scientifically understand. There was also a war with Spain in 1624 and then we find a change of government from James I to Charles I. Charles I ruled England from 1625 to 1649. Unfortunately, because of the differences between the parliament and the king, a civil war occurred and this civil war was fought in three different stages from 1642 to 1651. We also have this problem of the Irish rebellion at this time. Then after King Charles I was executed, the commonwealth was formed and we had this commonwealth period from 1649 to 1660 when the monarchy was restored in England with King Charles II. We also have another interesting phenomenon of establishment of this Royal Society in 1662 focusing on this scientific developments in the context of expansive trade and colonialism during this period. It is also interesting to see the literary context which is a kind of transition from Elizabethan poetry to Jacobian poetry. We find the old stalwarts Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Michael Drayton and Samuel Daniel writing in this period as well. A remarkable event of this period historically, religiously and literarily is the publication of this authorized version of the Bible otherwise known as King James Bible which was published in 1611. Another interesting 
point that we have to notice is the rise of populist sermons from remarkable priests like Lancelot, Andrews and John Dan. We have actually three different groups of poets writing in this early 17th century poets from Jacobin period, Caroline period and also this commonwealth period where we have cavalier poets supporting monarchy. Similarly, we also have poets who write for the court and poets who write for the church in the sense of thinking about gods, particularly Christ, father and things like that. So, we have both secular poetry and religious poetry at this point of time. Who are the well known practitioners of this metaphysical poetry? Actually, the several kinds of poets we have, in some sense or the other, they share certain features of metaphysical poetry. We begin with John Den, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan, Thomas Carey, Robert Herrick, Richard Lovelace, Abraham Cowley. We have to pay some special attention to him. Because of the life of Abraham Cowley by Dr. Johnson, we have this concept metaphysical poetry well explained to us. Then Andrew Morwell, Richard Crusher, John Milton also was writing in this period, but he is not considered to be a metaphysical poet. We have included him to indicate that he also belongs to this early 17th century. Based on the kings who ruled the country and the kind of system of administration they had, we have Jacobian poets belonging to King James the first period, we have Caroline poets belonging to Charles the first period and then we have cavalier poets and many of these poets are poet priests that is they were preaching in the church and still writing poetry very intensely. How did the term metaphysical poetry originate? That is what we are going to see in the next uh, few minutes. We have a number of theorists if you want to use that word from William Drummond, John Dryden, Samuel Johnson, Grayerson, T. S. Eliot to George Williamson. We will begin with William Drummond of Hathenden. He wrote a letter in 1630 to one Dr. Arthur Johnston and he used the expression metaphysical pejoratively that is negatively. He objected to metaphysical ideas and scholastic quiddities in his contemporaries, particularly poets. They extreme kind of images, idiosyncrasies that uh, he noticed in his colleagues he did not appreciate. Then we have John Dryden writing in discourse concerning the original and progress of satire in 1693. He mentioned if with reference to John Dunn that Dunn affects metaphysics. He had this in his mind when he wrote this phrase affects the metaphysics. Dunn was using a number of scientific terms and he was making obscure arguments of scholastic philosophers and so Dryden also did not use this expression very happily. Then we come to the site of this concept metaphysical poetry. It was Dr. Johnson in the 18th century who wrote the life of Abraham Cowley in 1779. In this context in the life while writing the life of Abraham Cowley who was a reasonably respectable poet at that time. We have to remember that Johnson did not consider Dunn to be a serious poet for his biographical series Cowley was. So, he wrote the biography of Cowley and at that time he mentioned in passing 
about the kind of writing that happened during 17th century. This concept metaphysical poetry does not relate to any subject or theme, it actually refers to the way in which the poem was written that is the manner of writing. Actually Johnson was complaining about the poets who were using such extreme expressions, images, symbols which disturbed the common sense. So, he wrote a passage like this, wit abstracted from its effects upon the hearer may be more rigorously and philosophically considered as a kind of discardia concurs. It means a combination of dissimilar images or discovery of occult resemblances in things apparently unlike. The most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. Nature and art are ransacked for illustrations, comparisons and allusions. Probably Johnson was also affected by this kind of far fetched images and that is why he is using that violent image himself ransacking nature and art for illustrations, comparisons and allusions. This phrase the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together is the soul of metaphysical poetry. <coughs> Obviously, Dr. Johnson used this concept metaphysical poetry very pejoratively that is negatively. He referred to a race of writers known for their display of learning, far fetched comparisons and absence of feeling. That is what Johnson felt about these writers. He included Dunn, Cleveland, Marvel, of course, Cowley, Herbert, Vaughan and Crusher. In sum, this metaphysical poetry is a witty composition combining quite opposite things, ideas, images. It had the pejorative meaning earlier, but now it has rose above this negativity and survived to describe a group of 17th century poets positively. We will see one example from Abraham Cowley. Abraham Cowley had a volume called The Mistresses and in this volume he has a poem called The Heartbreaking. This heartbreaking poem has this kind of combination of images serpent, love, poison, remedy, monarch, tyrant all in just five stanzas. Disparate things are brought together violent images are violently yoked together you can see in these five stanzas now. Let us see the first two, two stanzas the heartbreaking. It gave a piteous groan and so it broke in vain if something would have spoke the love within too strong for it was like poison put into a Venice glass. I thought that this some remedy might prove but oh the mighty serpent love cut by this chance in pieces small in all still lived and still its tongue in all. The next three stanzas now where you can find the juxtaposition of dissimilar images that is discardia concurs. And now alas each little broken part feels a whole pain of all my heart and every smallest corner still lives with that torment which the whole did kill. Even so rude armies when the field they quit and into several quarters get each troop does spoil and ruin more than all joined in one body did before. How many loves reign in my bosom now, how many loves yet all of you thus have I changed with evil fate my monarch love into a tyrant state. Various images from this serpent love poison, remedy, monarch, tyrant and in between we have rude armies, armies which are not controlled moving in different directions. So, the poet says he has different loves 
but all of them finally turn into a tyrant state. He suffers more, so he his heart is broken. It is not surprising that Johnson found this to be discordant for his years. Next let us look into Grayerson's publication which changed the face of metaphysical poetry in 1921. H. J. C. Grayerson was a Scottish scholar interested in the 17th century poetry. He was a critic, an anthologist and a historian of English poetry. He has published many collections of poems by various writers including Blake, Tennyson. He came out with an anthology of 17th century poems in 1921 called Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the 17th Century. T. S. Eliot reviewed this volume of Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the 17th Century for Times Literary Supplement and with the publication of this volume and the review of by T. S. Eliot, there was a strong revival of metaphysical poetry in the 20th century. In his introduction to the volume, Grayerson classified metaphysical poetry into two groups. One is Dante's kind of writing, where we have a philosophical conception of the universe and the second one is the kind of poem written by Dunn and his colleagues. Grayerson is referring to Dunn's metaphysical poetry with reference to a few features. They are intellectual, witty, argumentative, subtle, passionate, thoughtful and exotic. These are the common features that Grayerson noticed in metaphysical poetry of 17th century. However, he did not include Milton because he considered Milton to be different from Dante or Dunn. In his review of Grayerson's volume, Eliot noted a blend of thought and feeling in Dunn and other poets. He called it unified sensibility. So, he said a thought to Dunn was an experience, it modified his sensibility. What Eliot emphasized in this unified sensibility is thinking and feeling going together making up these metaphysical poets. Eliot also observed a dissociation of sensibility in the 17th century particularly after Dunn. In early 20th century many modernist poets started writing like metaphysical poets or Eliot found a similarity between metaphysical poetry and early 20th century poets particularly modernist poets in terms of telescoping of images and multiple associations. Actually Eliot was cultivating his own taste for poetry and creating a different kind of readership for modernist poetry in early 20th century. Later we have a critic George Williamson, he also discussed metaphysical poetry. According to him the crux of metaphysical poetry is wit and this wit is understood by various critics in different ways. For Grayerson wit is a peculiar blend of passion and thought, for Eliot it is a sensuous apprehension of thought. Similarly, for Herbert Reed it is emotional apprehension of thought and for Williamson himself wit is an embodiment of thought. This wit manifests in conceits of far fetched and shockingly disparate elements. The shocking element is something noticeable and it is appreciated by 20th century early 20th century poets like Eliot whereas, it was not liked by Dr. Johnson. Williamson also observed that this metaphysical poetry was a kind of revolt against the Elizabethan poetic conventions. In contrast to Elizabethan poetry, metaphysical poetry is more complex 
senseless and it had more intellectual strain. The effect of all these critical thoughts in course of time is what Johnson considered vices turned out to be virtues and appreciated later on. What are the characteristics of metaphysical poetry? We have already seen a few features. Now, here we have a listing of all of them. First, metaphysical poetry is colloquial, conversational, arresting and unifying language. Metaphysical poetry uses more of commands that is imperatives. It uses more of plain and familiar language. The chief characteristic of metaphysical poetry is of course, conceits, far fetched conceits and extended comparisons. There is no limit to comparing one thing with another. Of course, it is highly intellectual, witty and paradoxical. It makes arguments, logical arguments and readers are expected to be convinced by the arguments of these poets. A good example we have is John Dan's The Flea. Let us look into the first stanza alone here. Here it goes, mark but this flea and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is, it sucked me first, it sucked me first and now sucks thee and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin nor shame nor loss of maidenhead, yet this enjoys before it woo and pampered swells with one blood made of two and this alas is more than we would do. It is a very common situation of a flea biting man and the woman and in the flea the poet finds a union of the man and the woman what is considered to be something infectious, something a disease, something unhealthy, unwelcome, then makes use of this image to support his own love without any kind of pejorative connotation of this sexual union. The poet and the lady, the speaker and the lady, they are united in the blood which is infused into the body of this flea. According to Bradford Smith, metaphysical poetry is a paradoxical inquiry, imaginative and intellectual, which exhausts by its use of antithesis and contradiction and unusual imagery, all the possibilities in a given idea. This idea will predominantly be a psychological probing of love, death or religion as a more important matters of experience in the life of the poet and will be embodied in striking metaphorical utterance or in the use of common that is familiar or the scientific word. If you look into this definition given by Smith, we see all metaphysical poetry is a paradoxical inquiry and it uses antithesis and contradiction and unusual imagery. It probes into experiences like love, death and religion and it has a striking metaphorical utterance. For Smith, the best example of metaphysical poetry is from Andrew Marvel. Smith says, it has the metaphysical combination of thought and image, the sensuality, the universal outlook, the distinctively common diction. He gives this example, my vegetable love and also he mentions another characteristic of metaphysical poetry that is the metaphysical shudder which comes out of the awareness of the impending death. Smith quotes this passage from Andrew Marvell's to his coy mistress. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Another best example we have from Cleanth Brooks. He 
came out with this concept of this well wrought urn that is the image for a well made poem for Clarence Brooks. According to him the language of poetry is a language of paradox, paradoxical enquiry and paradoxical language we can connect them together now. Brooks claims that the only way by which the poet could say what dance the canonization says is by paradox by nothing else. What does the poet say? He says just like the saints the religious saints the lovers to renounce the world for the sake of their own love. The lovers can then rightfully be canonized that is made into saints. Here we have these two lines from Dan's poem the canonization and by these hymns songs in praise of love all shall approve as canonized for love. In this lecture we have seen 17th century metaphysical poetry against the historical and literary context with reference to the well known practitioners John Dunn, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan and Andrew Morwell. We traced the evolution of the metaphysical poetry concept from Drummond to Dryden to Johnson, Grierson, Eliot and George Williamson. We identified the features of metaphysical poetry particularly with paradox, unusual imagery, colloquial language and so on. We examine two best examples one from Smith and another from Brooks they have quoted both Marvel and Dunn as the best exemplars of metaphysical poetry. As usual we have some references for you it would be ideal for you to know more about metaphysical poetry by reading Eliot's essay the metaphysical poets and Smith's article what is metaphysical poetry. Thank you.